From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined with our guest super producer, Max the Freight Train Williams. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. It's one of the most exciting evenings of the week for us, fellow conspiracy realists. This is where we hear directly from you. Uh, We're getting, uh, oh, it looks like we have extra letters from home we're very excited about that we've got we've got some google results google search results i'm really interested in this conversation uh we we have a uh, an on the ground uh follow up to our recent discussions of flex and or surge pricing uh before we do any of that uh you guys ever want to just give up the podcasting thing and go get a bunker like an underground place to survive I have my basement. It's kind of bunker like. Uh, I just need to maybe reinforce the doors a little bit. I hang out down here a lot. I got everything I need. We were just talking off air. I got a mini fridge, got a freezer chest. What else is there? Vidgy games? Mm, a place to brew your beer in the cold, dank caves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what happens in my cold, dank rainbow cave. <laughs> And we're back with today's first piece of listener mail. This one comes from Flash, who's a regular contributor. Um, I think he probably DMs each of us separately uh, on the internet. I don't know if he's ever written in, but he's a... I don't want to give too much away about the guy, but he's a really, really impressive awesome photographer. Awesome, dude. Yeah, Unbelievable. great friend of uh, Stuff You Should Know as well. Okay, very good. Yeah, I don't, I'm not going to... He has to use the, the nickname Flash. He is sort of a public figure, uh, per se. He's got one of the, the blue check marks, but really, really talented dude. Um, we'll leave it at that as to uh, maintain his anonymity, because that is in the spirit of listener mail. But um, he did write in, uh, in regards to a conversation we were having. I can't remember what it was surrounding, but um, I think I brought up the fact that I I feel as though Google search results have gotten sh- here. Um, and I think results may may vary, and, and, and there's a good reason for that, which is what mm. we're going to talk about today. I've definitely been talking with a lot of people on social media, too, regarding this, because it's, it, you know, there's a threshold, I would argue, uh, Noel, that after a certain amount of people who don't know each other begin noticing the same phenomenon, That's right. we can't treat it as though, you know, we can't treat it as though people are imagining something or being gaslit. Well, and it also depends on what you're searching for. I don't want to get too too ahead of the of the curve here, or too derailed from Flash's message. But I actually saw a very um, interesting quote from Christopher Nolan, the director, uh, who had something very interesting to point out. And I think this will be actually a really good lead in to uh, to this story. And I'll just give you the gist of it. He basically said he feels like there isn't as much information on the internet as people think. Uh, Google is very good at certain things like cataloging your personal data and uh, and selling it to the highest bidder and, and using it to, well, maybe not that necessarily. Well, maybe that, but also specifically using it to serve you ads um, and tracking your movements and, and your you know, tastes and, and internet browsing habits, but not necessarily search. He points out that if you uh, went to the library and picked out like three different books and picked to, uh, flipped to some random pages and then searched for those online, um, you would probably results would be more in the underwhelming uh, direction than they would be in and having, you know, those results turn up. Uh, and so I think there is something to be said about that. I just thought it was an interesting way of putting it. But here is what Flash uh, had to say in his message to us via Instagram. Something you might want to have a look at. Just heard the podcast where you talked about uh, if Google search is getting worse. In short, it is. Here's a video explaining how they are intentionally making it harder to find the correct results. And he linked to uh, an episode of The Verge Cast. Um, big fan of The Verge all around. Really good tech reporting. 
uh, the, the folks that are on this particular podcast are very much embedded uh, or entrenched in the SEO world, which, you know, to folks that are casual Internet users or maybe more into like the techie side of things can be a little bit of a snooze. But we've kind of lived and, and, and breathed SEO uh, as part of big websites um, mm-hmm. and search late, engine optimization, search for engine wondering. optimization, 100 percent. And it's essentially the idea of Making your content, whether it be your website, you know, your blog, your company, your brand, uh, be prioritized in search. And Google has always kind of been a bit of a black box in terms of like what they do to change their algorithms. They roll out these big changes. And I remember back when we were more connected to the How Stuff Works website, there would be, I don't know if you guys remember this, there would be changes to the Google algorithm that would change the way content was was ranked in terms of quality content right and because some of the stuff on how stuff works were these little um kind of micro articles at times mm-hmm. or they were divided up uh, into multiple pages so you get served more ads we got hit um, by uh, this idea of it was no longer considered of a, of a higher echelon of quality content. It wasn't which, substantive. Substantive, because it was too much little, little snippets, kind of. Not to say that taken as a whole, this wasn't good writing. I mean, no, There's no shade on any of the writers for how stuff works, but a direction that many of these types of websites have gone in, 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 in recent uh, years is to break these things up so you can get more ads crammed in there. And that's not, you know, the writer's decision. That is the powers that be. And I think we're all annoyed by that. But that is the kind of stuff that can affect Google search results. But but a lot of those have switched back now to the yes. one pagers. Well, that's exactly mm. right. And that's because of this very thing, because it, uh, it gets it's not worth feeding. It's not worth. Okay, if you have more ads, but you have fewer eyeballs on the ads, then it doesn't really matter how many ads you have. So I think it makes more sense to prioritize the search engine optimization over cramming as many ads as you possibly can. That way you you can sell the ads that you do have at more of a premium because you're getting more page views. Um, so in order to operate like that, guys, mm-hmm. you have to kind of take a company like Google at their word when they tell you this is how we rank Quality of content. This is how we reward certain things with higher page rankings, you know, sure. come up in the results. And it's not exactly them telling you how to quote unquote game search. That's what everyone's trying to do. And I think one thing that this Verge podcast pointed out is that the folks that are the most successful with that are the ones that don't necessarily take everything Google says as the law of the land. They do experiments. Right. Like, I don't know if you guys remember when Mr. Beast uh, did a thing where he posted only thumbnails for his videos with his mouth open. Mm -hmm. Um, And and again, this is discussed in this Verge podcast. YouTube didn't tell him to do that. He just tried it out and realized that when he posted an image with his mouth open, he got way better uh, ranking in in, in the YouTube results. And that wasn't out of the blue. Uh, He does a phenomenal job explaining this and 100%. and I, I love what you're pointing out one interesting thing just for context that uh, folks need to know and flash you are well aware of this uh, the vast majority of people searching for anything on Google no matter what it is the vast majority do not go to page two of the results Oh, that's right that's why they, they, they've said it for years like if you're not on page one of the results you might as well not exist you know i mean that's it's it's sort of like being featured in like like apple podcasts uh they call it a what do they call their banners the carousel. or whatever their carousel if you're not in the first rung of that carousel before you have to click next you basically haven't been featured you know because unfortunately i mean i tend to click through i don't know about you guys and i do tend to click through a few search result pages but i think the vast majority of folks won't click to the next set of four image tiles or won't click on the next uh, page of search results so if you're not because people are kind of inherently a little bit lazy even on the internet where it's like a literal click you know to get you some more stuff loaded on your screen to look at Um, but here's the kicker What The Verge podcast is referring to is an article that they posted on The Verge 
May 31st of 2024. So a little late to the party on this story, but I think it is absolutely uh, crucial and prescient and information that we should all know and that clearly Google does not want us to know. Uh, the biggest findings in the Google search link um, by Mia Sato, um, who is the platforms and communities reporter with five years of experience covering the companies that shape technology and the people who use their tools. Per The Verge, um, the subhead, a set of 2,500 internal documents, including some related to search, call into question the past statements made by the company, que calling into question things like what they said didn't matter. Things that they said they weren't keeping track of. Right. Things that they said did not contribute in any way, shape, or form to your Google search rankings. There are things in this, this uh, cache of documents uh, that indicate that Google has kind of been lying to creators. Uh, to what end? It's not quite clear. It's a lot of documents. Um, but Google is, as, as is described, and I think completely accurately in this document, the biggest gatekeeper of the Internet. And they've always been a bit of a black box in terms of how their search works, how this algorithm works. Uh, they make it clear right off the bat that the Google search algorithm itself has not leaked. Um, and SEO experts don't suddenly have all the answers, but the information that did leak a collection of thousands of internal Google documents is still huge. It is an unprecedented look into Google's inner workings that are typically closely guarded. Um, it's, it's something that I think we should maybe even do a little bit of a deeper dive into. This is a very extensive article. Uh, there's a lot of like other kind of sub, you know, articles that are sort of using this as a jumping off point and doing further exploration that those that cache of documents fully available uh, to dig through ourselves. But one of the things that I think is interesting is uh, how they have um, clearly been being dishonest about Chrome. Okay, so Chrome, as we know, is also the most popular web browser in the world. And what this document or this uh, series of documents indicates is that essentially, surprise, surprise, Chrome is basically a key logger. Yes. And all of your stuff is getting reported directly back to Google. And I know that's no shock because we all, any of us who got an early Gmail account, it was so convenient, so snappy, so it worked so well. You may all recall that we basically agreed to allow Google to read our emails. Uh, that was an early caveat. In I love to it. Serve read my emails. Ads. I spent a lot of time writing good emails. I, I know you do, Ben. You are very, you are very eloquent in in, in both speech oh, and and, uh, and and the written word. But I, I, uh, I hear you. Man. You're one it's of the great problem. email writers of our generation. Oh, Jesus I would Christ! No. Um, but I don't give a shit about that either, dude. I really don't care. I, I I I fully signed on for that. But they, it's one thing where they put that in in the in the small print or whatever, and it was it was not that small because I remember mm. that from way back when. I first got my, you know, my original Gmail that I've had for however many freaking years it's been. Um, but with Chrome, they unequivocally have said they don't do that. They don't track your stuff. And which was it's just like, why lie? Like, of course you are. Somebody, and again, this is pointed out in the Verge podcast, at Google was like, well, isn't it our job to like figure out what kind of links people are going to and like how do we sure. do that let's build the most popular web browser in the planet and now we know everything and of course they're keeping track of that certain again i'm not an seo expert but there are certain things certain types of fields that are kind of hidden fields in uh html or whatever it is the the you know the underlying code of a website that they said were irrelevant uh this indicates that many of those things are absolutely relevant or absolutely being tracked um i just think it's fascinating and 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 very you know the, the whole don't be evil thing um it's no wonder they, they pivoted from that. It just feels like it's gone out the window. And I, I want to open this up to the group. I just want to read the last little quote here from the piece. Journalists and publishers of information about SEO and Google search need to stop uncritically repeating Google's public statements and take a much harsher, more adversarial view of the search giant's representatives. Uh, this is coming from SEO expert Rand Fishkin, who is a SEO uh, optimization veteran, kind of a, a guru in that field. And he uh, interviewed for this piece uh, with The Verge via email. And another guy named Mike King 
uh, who is also in that field. But absolutely. I mean, not that we ever should be in a place where we unequivocally believe everything giant corporations tell us about their processes, because I think if anyone's listened to the show enough and done enough of their homework, then we know there's always some form of obfuscation going on. But guys, does any of this, A, surprise you? And B, is there anything you'd like to know more about? Because there really is almost too much to uh, you know talk about in terms of like the types of attributes. 14,000 attributes mentioned in the document. Um, this, you know, this is going to be something that's going to be dissected for a long time to come. Yeah, I'd like to make this an episode. Uh, this is fantastic because uh, people know that it's true. A couple of points to give... Uh, Some context here, Flash and our fellow conspiracy realists. One, the clever thing about spinning off entities uh, is that you can pass the blame around like a hot potato. So you could Uh, say, conceivably, we at Google never lied. Alphabet made a decision, and that decision was not ours. Uh, I'd uh, I'd also love, for anybody who wants to read that excellent Verge article you mentioned, Noel, I'd also recommend... Uh, A publication that came out, I want to say January of this year, just search for, is Google getting worse? A longitudinal investigation of SEO spam in search engines. And this came out uh, right around the time people were getting really hot about uh, institutionalizing AGI or machine learning or LLMs, large language models. And this is It's a long read. I'm not going to lie. It's not super sexy because it's scholarship, but it is incredibly insightful. Uh, The last point I would make is incognito. Incognito is not incognito. You know, uh, the, the rule remains from the early days of talking on the telephone back when the operators had to switch you over to party lines and stuff like that. The rule remains. You should not ever assume that anything you do online is private if in any manner form or fashion the verge folks pointed out uh, a new browser that they were all just raving about that apparent i can't remember the name now but it was new enough that i think if you look up new secure browser or something it'll probably pop up but uh, that is the reason people like to use things like opera uh, and other you know browsers that that do potentially offer more uh, private browsing but man yeah when you're i think we can all uh, for all intents and purposes assume that if you're using chrome which i certainly am right this second in fact we are required to use chrome to run the streaming software that we use to record this very show mm. um, that you've got a direct line to Google HQ with everything that you're doing, incognito or no. Maybe they're talking about Brave or yes, sir. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, no, it was there's so many sexier. different ones. Yeah, now. Was, Brave's it was been a, around for a while. Yeah, no, yeah. Bra- yeah, this is something newer that I didn't recognize. I'll I'll see if I can find it by the end of the of the segment, if not the episode. But Matt, I, I know this is near and dear to you because you've been through all of these algorithm changes as well and seen all this stuff in the way. You know, Google essentially is God in this space, and I'm also wondering what you think about why this is making search worse. Is it because People are using, they're trying to do SEO based on things that aren't actually accurate or like as our listener Flash pointed out that Google is intentionally making search worse. I didn't exactly get that from the documents. I, I didn't know if you it, you saw something that I might have missed. Well, I, look, I don't know. I'm not an expert here, but it does seem when you look at Alphabet's fin- financials, like through Investopedia and a couple other things, they are still getting most of their money through ads, right? That's the way they make their hundreds of billions of dollars. That's why they're such a huge company still. But they are, like almost every other major tech company on the planet, pushing AI as hard as they possibly can. Given that well, they, they fell have, flat on their face with that first rollout of it, too, with like the glue and the pizza and all of that. You yeah, know? but given those developments, given the amount of money that they're funneling into those efforts, given the amount of information on everyone that they have, it does feel like they will probably have one of, if not the most robust AI, like uh, personally catered AI system that will exist on the planet in X years from now. And that they're building really consistently over time. And it feels like perhaps 
that's where all this is going or why things are changing. We just don't get to see that back end and understand how it's, how it is being, how the entire system is being modified, like for whatever the future thing is supposed to be. I'll tell you something interesting that I, I learned recently. I have a really good friend who uh, contracts with Google. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about what he does exactly, but he does deal with some of this AI stuff. And a lot of it is finding people to figure out what to do with this stuff and how to make it a product that people will want to buy essentially or like want to buy into at the very least and you know because everyone's got to use it it's the new hot thing and obviously there's things happening behind the scenes that'll make it very useful in terms of you know maybe optimizing search or whatever perhaps uh, any number of things but there are tons of people that are younger people that are being paid to like figure out stuff to do with this technology you know and and tons of money being thrown at it, to your point that is all from the inside perspective completely true and the, the browser is called arc by the way arc oh is the browser. oh there it is i i haven't played with that one yet i'll check it out we can keep this segment short because i really do think it's worthy of a, a deeper exploration i'm glad you think so too bim um I didn't really have any final words. Just the fact that these attributes, there's so many of them, and it's just essentially what this thing, you know, uh, indicates is that so many of these attributes that Google said they weren't using to categorize uh, quality, they weren't using to to rank search, they are in fact, at the very least, keeping track of. Now, I will say again, I'm no SEO expert either, but just because they're keeping track of it doesn't necessarily mean that's the driving force, you know, I mean, more data is more data. And I mean, as we know, in the, this internet, you know, world, the more data you have, the more power you have. So, you know, the more granular you can get, but to me, the biggest and easiest to, for most of us to understand takeaway was the stuff about Chrome. So there you go. Let's take a quick break, hear a word from our sponsor and come back with some more. Oh, thank you. By the way, flash some more messages from you. We've returned and we are jumping to the phone lines. Let's hear this message from Ralph. Guys, uh, I'm just going to go with you can call me Ralph because I'm walking my dog and that's my dog's name. Guys, I love the episode about holes and cave systems, but I cannot believe that you didn't even mention Cooper Pedy, this town out in southern Australia, where they just dug holes into the side of this mountain, full-size houses, just really cool shit. And and you just pay for a basic, you know, whatever size that you want, and then you can go in and ship away at it, and, like make your own shelves and stuff. But also, here in my neck of the woods, there's this place called Subtropolis here out in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. And it is the world's largest limestone underground metropolis. (laughs) I guess that's why they call it Subtropolis. Really cool stuff. There's like hundreds of miles of uh, routes to go down there. They used to have, and I think they still do, um, they'll have like a bizarre uh, little thrift or a flea market type thing going on down there. Oh, that's really cool. But on another note, uh, this is the third time in a row that y'all have made a Pet Cemetery reference. Like, have y'all watched Pet Cemetery here recently? I don't know. What's the deal, man? You know, sometimes, sometimes dead is better. Uh, <laughs> um, Love you guys. Uh, Keep up the amazing work. And uh, I'm really looking forward to part two of Holes Around the World. Who isn't always looking for more holes? (laughs) Y'all have a great day. Nice. Thank you, Ralph. And thanks to your dog. This reminds Mm. me, uh, we talked about this in, uh, in our Vampire Tunnel Missouri episode. Ooh, that was a spooky one. We talked about one of those, yeah, Subtropolis. We mentioned that place. That uh, was the culty one, right? With yeah, like that's the, all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it's wild. 
Um, the Pet Cemetery Rhapsody, I think that that movie just ruined all of us. I mean, no, I know the book as well, but I saw that movie way too young. And so a lot of that stuff is embedded into me. And I think we really just like doing the Fred Gwynn <laughs> kind of cartoonish uh, main accents. That's how it's how. You know, it's like, sometimes that is better. It's just kind of a fun thing to do. Mm hmm. Uh, but yes, Ralph, thank you so much, man. We're very glad you enjoyed that episode. The uh, The first thing that you mentioned here is something that I personally had never heard of. I wanted to see if you guys knew about it. Uh, Cooper PD, C-O-O-B-E-R-P-E-D-Y. This is a place in Australia where people have taken to living underground, fully underground, creating structures underneath the earth because... In this area, this specific area that is, what, roughly 527 miles north of Adelaide, of the coastal plains there in Adelaide, this place gets so hot that birds are known to fall from the sky, according to the BBC. Uh, electronics must be stored in refrigerators often or, you know, specifically cooled down. If you just had a house that was on the surface of the earth there, mm -hmm. uh, it would get so hot inside your house, no matter what kind of AC you got going on, mm -hmm. you, you have to put stuff in the fridge. Dude, here in Georgia, we've gotten situations where our phones will, you ever seen that, that message that comes up? Mm -hmm. Your phone's overheating just from it being on the dash. It's got like a, like a red, uh, triangle with an exclamation mark in it. That's oh, yeah. no joke. Oh Yeah. Uh, oh, but I think maybe one of the reasons that Ralph was so astonished that we didn't talk about Cooper PD is because that name is it's roughly translated from an, an indigenous Australian term that means, quote, white man in a hole. <laughs> hey, just where they belong. <laughs> Stick them all in there. <laughs> but it's literally like whole whole living, I guess. Uh, but th th again, this is just fascinating. And the kind of thing we were talking about. Just a little while ago when we were recording a full episode before this episode was recorded, um, just this concept of wanting to live underground or in a cave or in a place that the earth is already modulating the temperature so we wouldn't need technology of any sort, no matter what happened, uh, to keep us cool and livable in a, in a climate that is livable. If anybody has been to Cooper PD, if you have any you know, uh, experience there. We would love to hear from you directly. It is very, very, very cool. And it's not the only place that you mentioned, Ben, as you said, we have discussed Subtropolis. The second thing that Ralph mentioned, which is a huge underground business complex, massive, 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 massive. It was built out of a limestone deposit where this company went through and they basically I don't know, bored through the limestone and created these huge places where companies can move in. It's a temperature temperature controlled area and they can do things like work on vehicles and manufacture specific types of vehicles, or at least uh, basically you can lift F Ford F one fifties there. There's a, <laughs> there's a weird place in there. That's all about vehicles. Um, anyway, it's super cool. Have you guys seen pictures of this or videos of it? We talked about it before. Yes. Looking now, it's super cool. I guess a very rich opal deposits there. Lots of like precious gems and mineral deposits. Yeah. You're talking about Cooper. Cooper PD is opal. Sorry, the yeah. Australian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sorry, what, what was the way? What did we move on to? Sorry. We moved on to uh, Subtropolis, uh, the cool world's name. largest underground business complex. Mm -hmm. Oh, got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah. So, no, but the Cooper PD is also really cool looking and uh, very interesting um, structures jutting out from the sides of these kind of caves. Do you think we're going to go back to cave dwelling? guys is that is that in the cards for humanity don't call are it we gonna comeback. be forced underground yeah rock the bells with that one yeah the uh there there's a lot of speculation regarding this uh i can say on good authority that there are multiple not just well-to-do individuals but institutions uh who that are increasingly looking into this in sort of a uh futurism long-term hedging of bets. Uh, we know that good science fiction is only fiction for uh, a small amount of time. Ralph, you may be interested, uh, if you love sci-fi at all, you may be interested in some uh, some of the descriptions in Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves, uh, which concern the idea of how to survive a global cataclysm. The difference here in what is happening in Seven Eves is that that cataclysm is relatively quick. Uh, the cataclysms that the human the humans are facing now are slow burn, slow boil cataclysms, right? 
uh, the kind of thing where you look around, you might realize the surface of some part of the world is no longer habitable without technology, arguably what's happening already, uh, and then you decide to go underground. So in the parlance of corporate America, yes, there are institutions trying to get in front of it. And it's not a bad idea. It really isn't. No, I guess sorry I'm late to the party on this one, but I am looking at the official website for Subtropolis, which doesn't that in and of itself sound like the name of a Neil Stevenson novel? Like it truly, truly does. It does. But it's yeah, unbelievable. Good Lord. And it, uh, there's a quote here. Again, I mean, this is like for sales purposes, but uh, apparently uh, savings of $125,500 on utilities by locating operations underground. Yeah. Makes oh, yeah. sense. You're getting shielded from a lot of the elements, from a lot of the things that require you to just blast AC. I bet you can harness geothermal stuff. <laughs> Again, not, well, not a not a scientist here, but I bet there's some kind of way of venting. And I mean, there has to be. I'm just I'm, I'm curious as to what that technology looks like. But what is it? Seven million eight hundred thousand square feet. I yes, mean, and they have another six point two million expandable square feet. Uh, or ex- feet for expansion, basically in that limestone deposit that they hollowed out already. It's certainly untapped real estate, no matter how you look at it. The, you know what I mean? The underground. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the reason why I even wanted to talk about it here today after Ralph brought it up is because there is a foreign trade zone inside Subtropolis, guys. So this is like... Wait, is that like a free port? Let the ports be free. As above, so below. Oh, jeez. Yes. Uh, you can defer or avoid duties on imports if you send them there first. Oh, jeez. Okay. Which is, again, like a really attractive thing if you're going to build a giant factory underground like many. Not, they don't have a ton of places or companies there, but there are some and they are huge and they are very large. There is one place that is there that I thought you guys would find interesting, too. It is a... Film storage repository. That's oh. right. I heard about this one. Oh, yeah, the I don't know much about it. would be perfect for that. What's yeah. going on? I, yeah. But we're Prevent, talking like... Preventing the sudden, uh, <laughs> the sudden combustion. Yes. I imagine. Yeah. Yes. yes. But, but we're talking actual, you know, film in, inside the giant canisters and of, of things like The Wizard of Oz, which we false. just mentioned in that yeah. previous episode. But uh, super cool. Super, super cool. The last thing I wanted to bring up before we go away from Ralph's message, is a place called, oh, I'm going to have to say, I might say it wrong. Uh, Darren Kuyu, I think is how you say this. This is a place in Turkey, and it is so, so freaking cool. There are rumors of how it was discovered. There are humans living on the surface right in this area, right? And chickens that were kept in some of these houses at least according to the rumors, started to go missing. They're like, man, the chickens keep going missing. There haven't been any attacks. There are no signs of attacks. Where the heck are the chickens going? And then one person, at least according to some writing in the BBC and a couple other places uh, (laughs) back in 2022, one homeowner found that the chickens were going down into this hole that he'd opened up as he was doing some work on the house, wherein he discovered a giant underground series of tunnels which led into a huge underground city there in Turkey. It's in Cappadocia. Uh, Freaking cool place that I've never heard of before. Carcosa? It's like Carcosa, I guess. Carcosa-esque? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you can look this up if you'd like to. The article is titled Turkey's Underground City of 20,000 People, and it is in uh, BBC, BBC bbc.com. It's 85 meters beneath... The chimneys of Cappadocia, that's what it says. A subterranean city. Super stinking cool. 18 levels of tunnels. Imagine that, guys. 18 levels of tunnels. If you're thinking vertically, right? Whoa. I mean, there's some really cool information on history.com. There's an article uh, with a list of, I think, 10 or so under historical underground cities. Places like Orvieto uh, in Italy. Um, and uh, let's see. Another one is called... Uh, Petra is a very famous one, um, which I believe was featured in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So, I mean, the people of the past certainly dug it. Um, yeah. Now, a lot of these living spaces are reported in the West as like underground cities or underground towns or things like that. But often they are built into the sides of mountains. That's right. Which isn't necessarily the same thing. Darren Kuyu is very different because it is built down right. um, into the earth, which 
I don't know. I, I think separates it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Agreed. Yeah. You can also look up something called uh, Nevshir, I think is how you would say it. This is one of those that is built more into the side of a mountain. And it's reported, of course, in the BBC and other places as an underground city. Sorry, guys, I'm going on the rabbit hole now, Ben. I bet you're aware of this. Beijing has an underground city uh, that was essentially built as a giant bunker, you know, in the 60s and 70s due to the threat of nuclear war. Mm, dude. This is very interesting to me. Uh, there's lots more to learn here about underground living. Maybe there's something we can do on this in the future. Oh, about feels uh, perfect for that. Maybe how to live underground. Like, how do you, let's say... Um, if it was 200, 500 years ago, how do you just dig down far enough to to have a stable ceiling underneath you, right? Where if anyone, like let's say an invading army is coming through, how do you make sure the ceiling above you is going to be safe? How do you make sure there's enough room to live down there? And the people, whoever it was that actually built Darren Kuyu, they figured out that they need to make very small tunnels where you would have to actually like hunch over to get through the tunnels so that anybody who was trying to invade and come through would have to be in that posture as they're going through. So you, as a defending army, could say, uh-uh, you, you got speared, son. <laughs> anyway, just thought that was an interesting tidbit. All right, that's it. For this segment on Ralph, thank you so much, Ralph, for calling in with that information. I've got one letter from home, guys. You want to hear that really quickly? Yeah. Okay, here we go. This comes from an anonymous so-and-so. Hey, guys, I just wanted you to check out this Chewbacca impression. All right, have a great day. That was very good. <laughs> That was very good. <laughs> oh, man. You guys, I, I posted this on Instagram yesterday, but I saw a guy, I think it was sort of famous or went viral, a dude doing an impression of a Keurig machine, and it was just the best impression that I've ever heard, next to this guy's impression of Chewbacca. Excellent. All right. We will say goodbye, and we'll be back with more messages from you. And we have returned. I had a tough time uh, this evening going through some correspondence, but thought this would be apropos to many of us listening along at home, wherever we find ourselves in this wide world, on the surface, in the skies, or beneath the ground. Geist is coming in hot. Geist says, Hi, guys. You can refer to me as Geist. Done, bro. Long-time listener, first-time mailer from Germany. Love your work. Just finished your recent listener mail about your little detour on digital price tags. Let's call them e-tags and flexible pricing. I am no whistleblower and have no leaked documents to share, but what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career as an IT project and product manager in nearly every industry. We'll cut the voice there out of respect for you guys. Uh, guys <laughs> says, like Sean Connery. I like this. Guys, yeah, we're multiversing it. Guy says, I often find myself in the realms of CRM and customer loyalty. Yes, points, cards, badges. No, that is not everything there is to know about it. Geist continues, in Germany, flexible pricing is not immediately illegal, but it is considered so improper that with the exception of a few pilot projects, it is hardly applied in practice, although some large retail chains have had the infrastructure for it for years. The e-tags are only used for central price control. Now, I'm going to pause here, guys. I don't want to monologue. Uh, do we... Uh, can we give like a quick and dirty on flex or surge pricing? I thought we had really good discourse about this earlier. For sure. And we made a couple of fun, fun videos about it. I mean, it's just the idea that things can be much like airline tickets or concert tickets or whatever, like demand can in real time affect the price of things, which I've always come down on the side of that kind of doesn't not make sense to me. No, that's a double negative. It kind of makes sense to me to a degree, but I know it can also be gamed and taken advantage of. The best way to see it in action is to attempt to take a car riding service or a car share service at certain times of day. Like yeah. the same, the same trip will cost you vastly different prices depending on what time it is. 
And as I mentioned, I, I think previously, you can case test this. If you'd like to do a little experiment at home, you can take uh, here in the West, you can take the two most prominent uh, ride share apps, those being Lyft and Uber, and you can open them, open them both, put in the same trip and then close them and then reopen them. And sometimes you'll see not a big difference, but you will see an adjustment as they're attempting to scope out how much you will pay for a given ride. Uh, the, and you can see this regardless of the time of day pretty often. And in that we also know, I think I've, I've maybe mentioned or someone has mentioned that, you know, there'll often be a wait and save option um, that, you know, says, oh, it'll take up to 15 minutes extra or whatever, but it'll cost like $5 less. I swear I've never had a situation where I picked that option and the car didn't come just as fast as the regular one. So we know there's multiple ways of them gaming tricking you into thinking you're getting a deal in, in, in a way that benefits them logistically. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah, you're right, man. That is the perfect way. Uh, surge. I mean, that really, that term really honestly has become kind of one of those, Oh, eponyms, I guess. Is that the right term, Ben? Like for like, like that is people think of that word and they think of surge pricing, a car, ser car service. Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. You can also, uh, for instance, to your example, Noel, you can see things like uh, paying a premium for priority delivery in food delivery services. And it does not, it arguably does not change the actual order of operations other than costing you about five extra bucks. Uh, this is, is brand new ground for a lot of people. But as Geist will go on to prove to us this evening, a ton of work went into this before the public knew what was going on. So back to Geist. Uh, Geist says, the holy grail of retail, not just in Germany, I suppose, is not flexible pricing, but get this, individual pricing at the customer level. Although technically possible with a combination of e-tags, NFC and or fencing, these are kind of, we'll get into the weeds on this maybe in an episode in the future. Uh, these are a little bit, you know, they're, they're kind of like the spell language of uh, the IT guys in guys profession. Uh, but Guy says with a combination of various things, a different approach can be taken here. Moreover, at least in Germany, this would face immense civilian resistance. But thank you for this, Geist. Here's where it gets crazy. I've been involved in lots and lots of projects with almost every major grocery retailer in Germany and have developed loyalty programs that reward customers based on their behavior and history at the item level, right? How often do you buy Cheez-Its or Kinder Eggs and when? Uh, these rewards consist of coupons via indirect methods like points and badges and so on. Coupons for specific items completely tailored to the individual customer. There's no compulsion to use the program yet, but usually the incentives are so substantial that one really believes the illusion that it's worth it, which calls to mind, pausing here, calls to mind our earlier conversation about the rollout of the uh, of the loyalty cards here at U.S. grocery stores. Do you have a Kroger card? If you don't, you're paying a tax for not having one. Yeah, but the, but it's the tax, the illusion of savings is just not paying the tax, right? Like it's uh, well, and they're getting your data. They're knowing exactly what you're getting. You do tend to have access to some nice coupons, I suppose. What does this guy eat with so much garlic at 3 a.m.? Yeah, yeah, but, but it is a weird thing to think you are going to buy flour somewhere. So. If you don't buy flour at the place where you have some kind of ro loyalty program, then you're going to buy it at a place that just has some flour at whatever price it is that they sell it for. And then what goes into that company's idea of how much that flour should cost outside of the standard stuff that everybody's looking at, that is interesting. That Just this concept that there's an illusion that it's worth it. But in some way, it's going to be worth it somewhere for someone because it, you're going to find the cheapest, you know, replica of whatever that type of flower you're looking for, for is somewhere. It just yeah. depends on if it's at the loyalty place or not. It's the home uh, here in the States. It's the home of the pursuit of happiness. Why would the pursuit of savings differ in any logical way? Uh, I, I agree uh, with you guys. Uh, Max, Paul, can we get a hand washing noise as we return to guys? Perfect. There it is. 
Guy says, as a retailer, I can wash my hands of any wrongdoing and say, of course, Ben pays a different price for flour than Matt does. But this is not individual pricing. It's solely due to the loyalty app and its behavior. We have no influence on that. The use of credit score data is often hidden in the terms of service of these programs, to our earlier note about Google Search and Gmail. So even in the privacy-conscious Europe, it is possible to extract more money from people in less highly rated areas. For example, by specifically reducing non-essential products as a purchase incentive while keeping flower prices the same because they have to buy the flour anyway. And Geist says they tested the software. Uh, We implemented, says Geist. We made purchases based on several test accounts and were able to generate a range of 20 euros with the same shopping cart on the same day with a shopping cart total of 50 euros. So when they say generate a range, they mean they were able to make people pay $20 more and just sneaking it in. Uh, and then, you know, it says we can, and then goes on to say, you can add pretty graphics, gambling mechanics, right? Gamify it, loot boxes, Skinner boxing, behavioralism stuff, financing models. Remember, says Geist, we're talking about groceries and voila, the shopping dystopia is complete. Anyone who thought I don't shop online because I get exploited or lied to should consider that retail might be slower, maybe less technically adept. But it loves money just as much as Amazon and co. And will do anything to survive. Poor Geist, you have met more than once an ethical crossroads, it sounds like. And because you say, I still work in this industry and try to bring more ethical solutions to the table. In the end, however, we always end up in, I love this part, dark conference rooms with long robes whispering about individual pricing. Why they always be whispering like that? Because it's a crazy, Speak up. it's a crazy Speak idea. Up. We can't hear you. Well, especially yeah. in Europe, where as guys is saying, if you if you try to enact some of this stuff, you'd go, you'd hit right up against the privacy laws, right? So you gotta whisper it. So there's also, I mean, it is a frightening, dystopian thing. You know, imagine a world wherein you go to the same grocery store as other people in your neighborhood, but due to the data that has been collected about you, uh, the price of your quesadilla or quesadilla ingredients differs just enough that you won't notice it, but you could get fleeced. I guess, and not to, I'm devil's advocate, not to say that I support this, I do understand, you know, gas prices shift based on the market, based on what the market, you know, people are always trying to get as much as they possibly can based on what the market will allow, what consumers are willing to pay. Um, how is that any different than, than Uber knowing where you are and that you're trying to go to the airport and that it might be more important for you to get there quickly and overcharging you? The, how, how is this different than that? In yeah. terms of ethics. Oh, ethically, uh, I think we have to bracket the ethics at this I point and look at efficacy. Uh, the next time you guys are on the road with me, let's play a game. Not a saw reference. Let's open up our phones. Let's pull up the same rideshare app and let's see what price is which. Because I believe this is already occurring. I heard something really neat the other day. The The CEO of Arizona Ice Tea yes. um, made a big deal about that. saying it's got to always be 99 cents for this mm-hmm. giant honking 40 ounce malt liquor size can of, of, you know, sweet tea product. And since he came out and said that, people have been kind of watchdogging uh, Arizona Ice Tea at mm-hmm. stores and, mm-hmm. and calling out stores that overcharge for Arizona Ice Tea. And if you report it to the company, they they will stop supplying that store. They're very militant about it, which I applaud. I think that's super cool, but like, I can't think of any other examples of that. And, 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 and at a certain point, is it just the prerogative of the distributor and or the retailer to decide what the price should be or what their market will allow? Mm-hmm. Like, does does the does the manufacturer never? enter into it like i know it's it's different with cars sure you know there's like there's like list prices and you right. know for certain products there's In list SRP, prices that are set yeah. and you can discount it up to a certain point but how deep you go with that discount you do have some wiggle room but i just wonder you know who's 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 driving the the ship who's steering the ship here well my answer would be no one 
but perhaps that's a little bit nihilistic. Uh, the uh, you're you're right. You're right. It, it differs industry by industry. Uh, to end Geist uh, correspondence here, which again, Geist, eye opening, and thank you. Guy says, "I'd love to hear your opinion, the American perspective on this topic," and leaves us with some breadcrumbs. We're going to follow up uh, to your question, Noel. This idea of um, determining price, another comparison would be the famous hot dog of Costco. It's a loss leader, but right. it, 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 it has a benefit in optics and, and just, you know, getting butts through the door, you know, it's or whatever. It has to be some calculation there, but they will always lose money on that. But they gain and, and it's a good PR story. Right. Sure. I mean, yeah. yeah. There are other examples or areas of opportunity for this kind of thing, right? The majority of movie theaters make their money off of uh, not the movies they show or the films they show, but through the concessions. And just like with, you know, hot dogs have a very high profit margin if you do it correctly. So you can take an L on hot dogs. Popcorn has a cartoonish profit margin and it kept a lot of those theater companies afloat. So we can we can see the game writ large. And I'm wondering, too, to hear from you guys uh, before we get to a letter from home that we always like to end with. Uh, do do you guys see this as inevitable? in some form, or is this going to be like an NFT thing that gets rejected? Full disclosure, I'm kind of on the side of this sort of customer specified or targeted pricing. I'm kind of on the side of it being inevitable at this point. I I don't know. Um, I can see it working in conjunction with a lot of other things. And it does feel like it is going to be that way. Just based on, again, if, if I think right now specifically about how much Kroger knows about me, since I've been buying from them, that's the that's a grocery store here where we live, and Decades, that's a lot of places. Right? You've yeah. been using that same number for twenty years mm-hmm. easily, easily, and and they know exactly what I buy when I buy it and how much of it I buy, and it's all that's probably already factored in. If I was using their app, because I know on their app they do the thing that Geist is talking about, where they offer specific coupons to individuals, right? So I think they are already trying to do that thing that he's talking about. I'm not buying into that yet. So I think if we there's enough customer buy-in, then that's going to exist. Because otherwise, right now, how are you going to walk into a Kroger and uh, let's say the three of us walk past the same cereal aisle and Raisin Bran costs three different prices when we walk past it, right? Do you think? I mean, that's possible if you've got those electronic price tags on everything and you just as you walk past oh it's now 317 versus 326 or something like that (laughs) i mean maybe but i don't see how you do that unless it's a fully online experience where when you go to check out with your specific you know loyalty number and your credit card that's associated with your credit score then you could achieve it so you don't see it as inevitable at this point I don't see it inevitable inside a brick and mortar store. So as long as those exist, I don't Mm. think you can have this type of thing. But if everybody, the vast majority of people are ordering all of their products online, then Mm. I think it's an easy yes, because then all your stuff is in one warehouse that's getting sorted by robots that gets shipped to your house. We could also consider, and I appreciate that point, we could also consider the um, idea that increasing facial recognition technology is going to scale and become uh, much more affordable for a lot of institutions, a lot of private institutions, even unto the grocery stores, uh, meaning that there is a possibility in a world. I, I, to me, the idea that this is inevitable, I agree that it will roll out or already exist online, right? Shout out Amazon groceries. Uh, but, uh, but the idea of it going to brick and mortar is definitely on the table, in my opinion. It makes me think of like, you know, the whole homogenization of culture that comes along with these algorithms that we don't really have a say in which ones we're using. We're all kind of being driven with, you know, what's being presented to us by these algorithms in terms of the content we're consuming. I'm kind of wondering if there's an associated homogenization of like product choices and, you know, food items and grocery habits that's very similarly linked up to something like that. A hundred percent. So here in the American South, for instance, uh, 
people become loyal to a certain brick and mortar grocery store because it has things they can predict it supplying, right? So if you've gone to, for example, uh, Kroger's for many years, when you walk into a Trader Joe's, a Whole Foods, or a Publix, or a, oh, we still have a Piggly Wiggly. Now, Moreland, if you, walk into, Piggly yeah, if you walk into one of those, you're going to find that they satisfy the general milieu of customer needs, uh, but they do it through different brands because they may have agreements with different suppliers or different facets of Unilever, I should say at this point. Whereas a Trader Joe's visit might be sort of like a treat, you know, because you, you, you stock up on some specialty fun items. You know, I don't use Trader Joe's as my regular shop, but boy, when I go there, do I have a good old time. And there's also one right next to the movie theater we like to go to. So it's a great place to sneak in some sneaky movie theater snacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we mentioned this before, but a, a huge organization like Trader Joe's at this point is a massive corporation yeah. uh kroger masquerading is a massive, as a mom and pop kind of right it's but yeah, funny but it, they just bought albertson's kroger did they just merged with them so they're all it's homogenizing the way you're talking about with the, the manufacturers of the food as well right so it i don't know i yeah the more i think about it I'm, I'm leaning towards the way you're thinking ben that you could do it at the store you could this is all happening already it's in it's everything they need's in place mm -hmm. you just currently do it through an app and that's how you control the price. The conspiracy is real. Please don't ever forget this stuff goes deeper than the government's debt. Whatever. We're going to end one of my favorite things uh, for listener mails, letters from home. So just, uh, just some nice, nice vibes. Some, how you doing? How are your folks? Uh, and we'll, we'll give you this one. Hello, conspiracy realist. Uh, what's a good nickname that starts with an L? Like a cool nickname that starts with the letter L. Lavender. Lalo. Lavender Lalo writes in to say, hey guys, I'm just writing in because I know you love these lottery style odds games, but when I choose to listen to the new Stuff They Don't Want You To Know episode or my current audio book, I didn't think it'd be a notable choice. I was wrong. You mentioned in the podcast that Mandate for Leadership, the conservative promise, was about as long as the unabridged version of The Stand. Any guess what my current audio book is? You guessed it, the uncut version of The Stand. It's a nearly 48-hour listen. Ah. <laughs> so that, that came up when we were talking about Project 2025. Exactly. I that to my, my buddy Harry who was visiting, and he has read the other. It's a little shorter, I think. Uh, the Project 2025 is a little bit shorter than the Isn't it weird? Stand. Yeah, you yeah. get to, like, uh -huh. page 1,000, and yeah. you think, oh, man. Uh, so uh, for The Stand. Uh, and... And Lavender Lalo says, this is my second time listening to it. And since you drew the parallel, I'm wondering if the stand would be an even better Bible to base our next president's <laughs> office off of. With the current yeah, right. state of affairs, it seems fitting to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then continues, uh, we're going through some of this to paraphrase. Lavender says, anyways, not accounting for taste, but you guys always seem to catch my attention. Thanks for the endless stream of fantastic topics. I've been listening for, beat me here, Max and Paul, holy sh eight years. Beat me again. F I'm old. I did yes, originally. How do you think we feel? <laughs> I, right? I did originally run back all your episodes in the first three years or so. So I'm mostly up to date. Huge fan of Ridiculous History, too. I was actually a listener there first. This is the heartwarming part. This is why we do letters from home. Thanks for being something I can be proud of in my city that I was born and live in. People who live in Atlanta, in my opinion, truly have earned their title AT Alien as they are most likely not from here. I really do feel down about my hometown as I don't feel like it's home anymore. It's changed so much. I don't know if it's because I'm old and crotchety, but I remember my Atlanta being a better place back in the day. Anyway, I got way off topic. I just wanted to express why I value such a positive influence in you guys with seriously good values and conversation skills. Like our boys in the military, I'll throw this against the wall. I'd love to buy everybody some wings at the local to say thanks. Oh. Hit me up if you want. Otherwise, keep on keeping on, homies. Oh, we must. What a sweet, what a, what a nice thing to say. That Lavender. Oh, man, I hope you like the nickname, man. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, nothing actionable on there, but I, I think it's, it's a vibe we can all agree with and in the spirit I of have local yeah. wings in asia so we got i would love to they're doing new sauces no way yeah yes way to don't okay. give me well, anything but that sun-dried tomato get out of town <laughs> i like that sun-dried tomato i like that lemon pepper wet they're messing with the ghost peppers matt 
Okay. Can I get you sun dried <laughs> ghost peppers? I so, bet you could double dip. Yeah. So we're ending on a cliffhanger here. Uh, big, big thanks to everybody who took the time to tune in. Thanks Seriously. to guys. Uh, thanks to Lavender, to Ralph Anonymous, uh, Chewbacca. Thanks to Flash. Uh, and thanks to you, folks. Uh, we hope you join us for future explorations of Weird Rain, future explorations of, oh my gosh, we got all sorts of stuff. Sky Jelly. Uh, look, just hit us up online. We try to be easy to find there. Sky Jelly, also not a bad band name. Or maybe a really bad band name. I don't know. I can never tell. It's usually one or the other. We are Conspiracy Stuff on YouTube, where we have video content coming your way on the regular. XFKA Twitter, as well as Facebook. We have our Facebook group here is where it gets crazy. On Instagram and TikTok, you can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff Show. Put this number in your phone right now. 1-833-STD-WYTK. When you listen to an episode and you've got a cool idea, you've got something that you can relay to us from your personal experience, call that number and tell us everything. In three minutes, of course. When you do call in, give yourself a nickname. Whatever it is, we don't care. We're just excited to hear it. And let us know if we can use your name and message on one of these listener mail episodes. If you've got more to say than can fit in a three-minute voicemail, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are the entities that read every single email we get, and gratefully so. Actually following up on some more correspondence this evening. When you send us an email, we can all read it. We can all respond. Uh, Just be aware, sometimes the void writes back. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.